Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palanker. Just imagine that Mar a Lago is the giant warehouse of all things pop culture. And Wheezy and I have been given a warrant to sift through all the boxes looking for items marked awesome so we're we can call them masters. to your attention. <laughs> we're the special masters. <laughs> we're, we're, awesome. Items for your viewing, listening, and reading pleasure. And occasionally we get a, a really lucky, like we are today, that have guests that are a major part of the American cultural landscape, like Felix Cavalieri, the founder of one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time, certainly the greatest blue-eyed soul band of all time, The Rascals, my favorite. I'm so stoked and honored to talk to Felix about his life's journey, about his musical journey, and the place The Rascals have carved out for themselves in music history. Felix will be with us in a few minutes. Wheezy, what do you have? Oh, well, uh, last week, Fritz, Joe Biden gave a speech designed to recalibrate our alignment with our common purpose and our underlying principles as Americans living together free and proud in a constitutional democratic republic. Some folks found that message disturbing. Did you notice? I do understand the basic differences between conservative and liberal ideologies. I struggle to grasp how the far right, often evangelical Christians, find leadership, wisdom, service, or anything remotely Christ-like in Donald Trump. So (laughs) Felix is laughing. Okay. Because he's like, Felix is like, what do you mean? Uh, (laughs) So I have been broadening my awareness with two podcasts, which are helping me better understand the embrace. Let's start with the Orange Wave, a history of the religious right since 1960. This podcast is from Dr. Bradley Onishi. He's a co-host of the podcast Straight White American Jesus, which explores the politics of Christian nationalism. In the Orange Wave, Dr. Onishi combines personal storytelling with extensive research and interviews with leading scholars to help unpack and examine mitigating influences which have forged the religious right's core belief that God intends for white Christian men to rule the world. This central thesis leads to a celebration of hyper-masculinity, authoritarian rule, conspiracy theories, and a belief in an impending apocalypse that encourages the Christian right to embrace guns and neglect the health of the planet. Using Orange County, California as a prism, Dr. Onishi traces the rise of the religious right resulting from a coalition of transplanted Southern and Midwestern Christians, the rise of the megachurch, televangelism, fear of integration, ambitious politicians and business leaders, billionaire donors, and opportunistic autocratic regimes at home and abroad. The Orange Wave offers the first episode for free, and then you'll pay $20 to keep listening. It is well worth it. This is the type of deep reporting that truly raises our understanding of one another. And I find that when you learn why truly wonderful, decent, kind people are supporting Trump, it tamps down the rage, which is good for the soul. But we know that they are out there and they are active and we need to be more active and to vote. I am also, did you want to comment on that? Well, I, I just want to say that, that that's where the term behind the uh, orange curtain came from. Right. Uh, and, and that reached its peak during the Ronald Reagan as governor uh, scenario. Right. It, but can, it has softened up a little bit. As a matter of fact, 52% of Orange County voted for Joe Biden as president of the United States this year for the first time in many, many years. So there, there is hope on the horizon. Well, that's why they are now resorting to authoritarianism, because if you can't win through... Yeah, they're losing their democratic elections you just have to strong arm it so uh another one that i'm reading is called it's a podcast that i'm listening to excuse me it's called fever dreams fever dreams is a weekly podcast from the daily beast that takes you behind the QAnon crazy curtain laying out the cast of conspiracy slinging characters that concoct the disinformation talking points currently fueling the republican party hosted by kelly weil and will summer fever dreams is an ongoing series with new episodes dropping every wednesday check out the orange wave straight white american jesus and and fever dreams to deepen your understanding of what Democrats are facing as we struggle to save, restore, and balance our fragile and precious democracy. Two good suggestions. Yes. This week I'm going to do Mike. Mike is a biographical miniseries about heavyweight champion Mike Tyson. It's streaming on Hulu. New episodes drop on Wednesdays. This is a violent, dark, yet very poignant story of one of sports most controversial figures. It starts with a nothing short of miserable childhood in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn where he was bullied badly as a child. He was abandoned by his father at the time he was born. He was severely emotionally abused by his mother. And when you see this backstory, 
you understand the animalistic violence he was able to show in the ring and that that was almost inevitable. He was always looking for a father figure, which he first found in his first trainer, Customato, who also officially adopted him later on. Later, he tried to find a daddy in Don King, the notorious fight promoter, and that set up a completely dysfunctional relationship as well. The subtext of the entire series is that Mike is on a quest for love, but often going about it in the wrong way, including his tumultuous marriage to Robin Givens. There's some heartbreaking surprises, though. And and what you learn is under this killer exterior lurks a very vulnerable man and surprisingly smart. They intercut the story with clips from his one-man Broadway show, which shows his ability for deep thought and honest introspection. He'll occasionally surprise you with brilliant observations about himself. Now, Trevante Rhodes really paints a great portrait of Mike in the lead character. Laura Harrier is Robin Givens. Harvey Keitel plays Custom Auto, a great role. He's not only Mike's trainer, but again, the only man, honestly, that Mike ever completely trusted. A very interesting look at how incredible damage can lead to incredible greatness. It's Mike. New episode drops tomorrow night. All right. I think I'm ready to meet Let's do it. Yes. I can't wait to introduce Felix. My, my pleasure now to introduce the great Felix Cavalieri, co-founder of The Rascals. They had three number one hits, seven songs in the top 10, 13 gold records, two platinum selling records, sold a total of 30 million records. He tells his story in a great memoir called Felix Cavalieri, Memoirs of a Rascal. And I have to do a little backstory here. I I grew up in Philadelphia uh, and part of the DNA of every Philly kid is a predisposition for rhythm and blues. I always loved the funkiness and the harmonies. You know, this is the territory of the Philly sound with Gamble and Huff. The truth is, though, that music didn't always come from black artists. There were soulful grooves and harmonies coming from white guys, too. The Righteous Brothers, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. But I think the most powerful example of blue-eyed soul was the Rascals. A Girl Like You, I've Been Lonely Too Long, all those hits. And when I was 13 years old, I bought the Peppermint Twist. This was a single by Joey D and the Starlighters. It was the fourth record I ever bought. The one just before that was Finger Poppin' Time <laughs> by Hank Pallard and the Midnighters. And the one before that was uh, Get a Job by the Silhouettes. The first one was um, uh, Hound Dog by Elvis Presley, but I needed my parents to pay for that, so that's why I bought that one. But I'm, And we're going to talk about the connection with, with Felix and Joey D and the Starlighters, which was part of his origin story as well. It's the great Felix Cavalieri. Thanks for being here, Felix. My pleasure. My pleasure. Really happy to talk to you. Uh, likewise. You, likewise. You're, you're a, a product of the cultural fabric of uh, Pelham Manor in New York. As a matter of fact, three of the rascals were Italian-American. Talk about your upbringing and the, just, just the flavor of that neighborhood when you were growing up. Well, the nice thing about it is that uh, it was a safe haven in between three very large cities. New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, Bronx, 20 minutes from New York City, but a safe haven. So uh, I, I like to say that I could just walk 15 minutes in any direction and get beat up. You know, that's how <laughs> it, you know, but it was nice because uh, I was able to get a fantastic education, which I've, I've always been thankful for for my parents because that's why they moved there. And I was able to be culturally alive, you know, uh, uh, which is important. Uh, as as for the music, well, you know that that's in the book. But uh, I live close to New Rochelle, uh, where I was able to kind of hear. Uh, you know, in those days we had little record stores. You know, we used to go in the record store, close the booth, close the door, and just play. As long as we bought something, we could stay all day. <laughs> so you know, that was my exposure. That was your Google. That was my Google. That's so cool. Now, yeah. when you were musically gifted, you're classically trained. And when you kind of got your um, first earful of rock and roll, I think you were you were pretty much sold, right? Well, yeah, you know, I don't know if you if if you have seen the uh, Elvis film, mm-hmm. but uh, if you haven't, you should. It's uh, it's really good, number one. But uh, it was kind of like a similar situation, although a little less dramatic. Uh, you know, he 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 heard it in the churches. He heard the gospel music down south. You know, and and basically what I heard was uh, was Mr. Alan Freed. 
You know, uh, mm-hmm. Alan Freed brought his uh, moon dog uh, from Cleveland to call rock and roll in uh, New York City, WINS. Mm-hmm. That was my first exposure, and, and uh, I really never heard anything like it in my life. It really changed, changed my life. Well, we have to talk about, uh, I mean, you're, 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 you, you eventually made your way to rock and roll, but we have to talk about uh, the pilot light in your life about music in general, and that was your mom, yes. who you lost at 13 years old. She was the right. driving force of your life, and she was a great disciplinarian in you learning classical music. So talk about that. And there's a great story in your book about being playing stickball in the middle of the street <laughs> with your mom. I'll, I'll let you tell the story. It's really funny. Go. Well, basically, you know, she saw a, a, a talent, and 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 uh, she, uh, you know, enrolled me in a in a, in a pretty serious music school, uh, uh, which was called the Allaire School of Music, and I and I I, w- I was taking three lessons a week, uh, which was kind of hard, you know, because I mean I really loved to go out, you know, and you know we didn't have computers to occupy our brain in those days, but we used to go out and play, and uh, you know, like uh, when there's time for a lesson. Um, gee, I don't really want to go. Well, guess what? You know, my mom would park on home plate (laughs) until we got in the car and left. Uh, Otherwise, there was no game. So I really appreciate that because um, that's what it takes. You know, you, you, you gotta you gotta sometimes push stubborn kids. Well, that uh, that kind of like infused your soul with not just the music, but the talent to create the music you were feeling and hearing in, in your head. Like it, it could come out of you, you know, because you had all those building blocks assembled, at, you know, as a as a young child. But uh, well, yeah, go ahead. No, the thing was that you know the classical music I found very confining. Mm. You know, I I um like for example, uh, if, if if I as much as just varied which hand hit the keyboards. You know, first hmm. uh, the the teacher would say, "No, no, 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 no. That's ah. that's not how Mr. Bach wanted it." Right. So there's no improv so, room. So I really felt that uh, uh, kind of like inhibiting factor uh, to what was to be known as creativity, which I didn't even know existed hmm. until you know basically I started to explore. So um, you know, rock and roll really uh, allowed me to explore. It's interesting that the instinct to create would be told you would be told it's wrong and i I wonder how often we do that with kids you know we we expect an absolute and we kind of like uh inhibit their natural curiosity and inclination to create yeah i I mean seriously uh uh, that's a good point when it comes to classical anything you know uh uh, dance uh music uh uh, art you know i mean uh, i don't know that you can teach abstract art you know, mm. you probably teach a different whole kind of like way of uh, painting. But that's a good point. You know, really, uh, you should not inhibit that creativity. But we ha- you do have to build some, you do have to kind of like put a foundation down of some basics, whether it's a golf swing or whatever it is. That's uh, what they said about Picasso. He, he, was a, he was a great representational artist. He had to learn to draw figures perfectly to eventually wander outside mm. those lines to do his own kind yeah, of Yeah, like you have to imitate before you can innovate. There you go. Perfect. Well, I, I, I think that way. However, today, uh, I don't know how involved you, know, you are with the new computer progress for music. But it's a whole different thing now. Be, be, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that uh, uh, people are educated in music uh, if it's necessary. They're more, more educated in technology. Mm, that's an interesting point. Um, I want to talk about your band for a moment because you, you handpicked your guys uh, right. they were for, for being great players. And you were all really be, you really became very well known for your incredible musicianship. But when four young guys have a hit, and are shot out of that can, and not everyone has the personality fortitude to handle that type of experience. Well, I'm not sure we handled it. <laughs> we we had a uh, uh, we we had a lot of fun. We really did. We we uh, we started off, you know, a kind of like an experiment, you know, in what was kind of like the, you know, bands, you know, which was inspired by the English uh, bands coming over. Uh, but you know you're right you have to deal with it yeah and uh, it's not easy to deal with if you're not all on the same page yeah eddie brigatti was your lead singer and he was this vibrant great charismatic performer as a front man should be although you shared uh, co-lead singing duties with him but his that that made him a three-dimensional character he was also troubled in that way too and it it made it difficult particularly as the band progressed a little while 
Well, there's there's a lot a lot of lot of psychological stories. Not only Mike Tyson, but we we had our <laughs> own. Oh, you yeah. know, it's very interesting. You know, to some people, what you know caused him uh, Eddie to be Eddie. You know, a lot of it had to do with his family and his his brother. For example, his brother had a situation with with a group called Joey D and the Starlighters, which you mentioned earlier, in which he was the lead singer mm. and did not sing the hits. Oh. So I think when he came into the world uh, of music, he already had his guns drawn. You know what I'm saying? They okay. were out. They were ready to go, you know? And I'm not sure that our organization warranted it that, you know, warranted that type of behavior. But however, he was ready for anything. I mean, he, his, Joey was on Roulette Records, which is historic. If you read, uh, you know... <sighs> But if you read, read about uh, Morris Levy, you'll know exactly, you know, what that's all about. But Yeah, Tommy James's book has a lot about that. Tommy James' book is, yeah. is, is, is really uh, the, 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 the Bible of that story. But, yeah. you know, but to his credit, you see, Tom, Tommy, uh, is, he's not a bitter man because mm -hmm. of that. Because what, what he says is, and I respect him for this, is, look, I'm still famous. I'm still known. I can still work. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't all bad. It just, that's what my story was, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, wait, let's talk about Joey D because that's, uh, you know, w w there was, even before you joined the band, they sort of represented what the uh, Rascals represented. They were a multicultural band, right? They had black yes. and white guys in there. Absolutely. At a time when that wasn't uh, very well received by the public and by the business. But you always, from the time you were in bands in the Pelham Manor area, you were always in mixed race bands, which shows up in your blue eyed soul later. It, it was yeah. that just because it was natural to you you saw the value in that what what, what? it was natural to me you know i i mean i i think a lot of the young people that I, you know i come across they don't really see color they see man this guy can sing you know mm -hmm. well if you can sing i, I you know i want to want to hook up with you you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. oh I, I see i gotta i i can't do that because because why because you're black i i don't get that yeah. Well, Stephen Van Zandt said a great thing in your in your uh, hall of, uh, rock and roll Hall of Fame induction. He said, oh, yeah. "To be that black, to, ha to sound that black, you have to be Italian," <laughs> which I thought was a yeah. great line. Yeah, yeah, that was that was an interesting situation. You know, that's how he got the part. You know, in yeah. the Sopranos. You yeah. Know, yeah, that's... that was a that was a really interesting story. Uh, you know, it was like you know, that guy could put together some words and and be and resonate. And, you know, and he deserved all that, all that attention. But you had another interesting experience that night that kind of blew me away where, where Hal David pulled you aside and said something to you. You want to tell that story? Well, that was a different night, but yes, the story oh. is true. Yeah, that was the Songwriters <laughs> Hall of Fame, you know, and uh, oh boy, that was an interesting night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, how, Mr. David, I, I'll tell you, he was a, a fine man. I mean, not not only one of the greatest talents, you know, with him and he and Burt Bacharach created some of the finest music that America has had. He was just a real mensch, great guy, you know. I mean, uh, and uh, so when he spoke, we listened, and he said, "Man, I thought my partner was uh, difficult." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you want to have two interesting reads back to back, read read Burt Bacharach's biography and then read Carol Bear Sagan. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Wow. So let's talk about the writing process. You and Eddie wrote most of the songs? Yeah, well, you know, uh, again, we, we, the Beatles kind of paved the way for that. You know, they, they had this wonderful team, you know, and, um, you know, I think that, that if, if, if you look at the, the current, like, uh, you know, uh, revelations as to that team, you, you get a good picture of who did what. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Paul certainly was the impetus behind, you know, those songs. And, you know, it, it shows because look at the longevity this man has had. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a similar situation. I, I just felt that Eddie had a, a, a gift for uh, writing lyrics. And, uh, you know, I tried to nurture that and tried to help him along. And, uh, you know, it, it's just an interesting story because he did well. And then he didn't do well, you know, and so I had to pick up the slack and it just it's a shame that we stopped because I, I, I always felt that, you know, you got a winning combination, you know, keep, keep it going, you know, but no, he stopped. I, no, and I mean, that was definitely your your intention and you were you were willing that to be so, but it, it just felt like there was a wheel coming off the cart and there was no no way to get around that. 
You know, you, you learn so much in life, you know, I mean, if you pay attention, you know, and uh, especially with a situation where you have, like I say, a winning combination. I mean, actually, the four of us were, were a winning combination. And then all of a sudden, as you say, one wheel comes off, it starts to roll its own way. And I never really understood it. So I, 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 I really find out that, you know, human nature is pretty darn interesting let me tell you <laughs> oh I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by it and so when, when you read the pretty book, interesting yeah because you know you go out of your way to be deferential and kind but you're not the reader isn't sure whether it's mental illness or drugs or jealousy or a combination of, of all of the above families okay mm -hmm. families can really get in the way man Mm -hmm. You know, I find it interesting. Listen, how come uh, how come he's on the camera the whole time? Right. How come they didn't take a shot of you, you know? Mm -hmm. Little things like that, you know, when you go home and you're watching the uh, Ed Sullivan show or Hullabaloo or something like that. Those little things, they stick in your subconscious, you know, and, and all of a sudden you say, oh, look at that guy. He's t I, I don't run the cameras, you know? <laughs> but it, it, it's an interesting life we have. But... Uh, you know, I really have no complaints except for, you know, I'm really sorry that the group decided uh, to, to break up, uh, that Eddie decided to leave because we had a good thing going and we, we had a lot of fun, we made a lot of people happy. So I want to finish the Joey D and the Starlighters theme here, and that is you were playing in the Catskills and then had an opportunity to go and they lost their keyboardist hammond yeah. b3 is your big instrument and right. uh they lost their keyboardist so you were invited to go to europe and finish their tour with them and then you, that set up your uh relationship with the brigatis and then the rascals spun off of that yeah it's really interesting how things happen you know and, and that's one of the reasons that i wrote the book uh because, well, I, I think I've said it before, but it, the reason I started that book was because we did this um, we did this Broadway show with Steve Van Zandt called mm -hmm. Once Upon a Dream, which mm -hmm. was you know based on uh, you know one of our albums, and we did press conferences during that period of time, and each of us you know were asked questions, and I, and I noticed that we all had a different answer for the same question. Wow! <laughs> Everybody had. A, I said, well, wait a second. I I I I really. I think I was there, you know, but uh, uh, so, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, uh, it's the last man standing that tells a story like Custer, you know, yes. I mean, you know? <laughs> when so, right, the history. as I was writing that, as I was doing that, you know, I said, well, wait a second, you know, like uh, that with all due respect, the rascals seriously were only, I would say five years, you know, together, maybe six of my life, which is had a few decades, you know, got a lot of decades behind me now. Uh, maybe I should continue and just, you know, tell my story because one of the reasons is I really did not have any idea that it, I was going to be a musician. I thought I was going to be in the medical field. You know, I was in pre-med and it happened and it happened because somebody up there wanted it to happen. And, and so that's what I was trying to get across to people is that just relax, man, let, let, let life take its course and you may find what you're supposed to do here, you know. Mm -hmm. And you've learned a lot spiritually along the way, like you've been open to, uh, I mean, you've been vulnerable and open to learning and growing, and, and you've learned, talk about uh, what you've learned about ego. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's all going back to the uh, guru that I, I was fortunate enough to study with, Swami Satchidananda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you know, uh, Beatles made such a influence on all of us i mean you know, the entire you know world was was you know and and when you know like they started to uh study with maharishi i happened to know george harrison a little bit and i, and I spoke to him about that and i, I asked him i said hey, w w this is real serious stuff isn't it he says very very and i said well what do you think he says i think you should do it i think you should get involved and again the path led me to that and during that period of time, I, I, I found out that the majority of the subject matter that the teacher was, was saying was all about the dangers of ego. Mm -hmm. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, if we just look at the last few years here, I think we can put a big E on that, man. <laughs> wow. Absolutely. Very large E. I get what and, you're saying. Uh, you realize, wow, yeah, okay, so that causes a lot of trouble, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So, yeah, uh, and, 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 you know, when you study something with somebody, uh, if you have the, uh, you know, the wherewithal to kind of like dig into what they're trying to tell you, you find out, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. 
But what's the healthy amount of ego? Because we all need to have confidence. Yes. Well, that's a difficult question, you know, because, I mean, like, as I say, you know, without ego, you're just drifting along. But, you know, sometimes it might be better to drift along than cause all the trouble that we've had in the last few years. You know, uh, I don't know the answer to that. You know, as I say, that what's the right amount? I think that has to do with every everybody person out personally. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's. Uh, you know, you can't, like, you know, I've got daughters, and, you know, daughters don't have a lot of self-confidence. I noticed that, you know, although women are taking over the, the country, there's no doubt about it. Thank Get God. out of the way. Here they come. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, uh, they, they have a tough time in business. They have a tough time, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, one of my daughters is an architect, and, you know, she's little, and she's, she's trying to talk to, you know, construction people who are three times her size, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, you need some ego, obviously. You need some ego. But some is a very quantitative word, you know, how, how much that is, I, I really couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. I think the right amount of ego is, and, and Wheezy and I have talked about this with other guests, the right amount of ego is when somebody can be enormously talented, but they're comfortable in their own skin, and they don't have to lord their talent over you and mm. be condescending with you, they're comfortable enough to allow you to be their equal. Do you, do, does that make sense? Imagine allowing somebody to be your equal. Wow. Where are we? Yeah. What planet are we on? Yeah. Allowing me to be equal. You know, Swamiji had a story, which I guess I could tell on the, uh, yeah. Sure it's, a, uh, it, it's about the, it's the same thing. It's about the right hand and the left hand. Mm -hmm. You know, in India, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rural counties, you know, you, you pray with your right hand and you don't have toilet paper. You have a little valve over there with, you know, you're kind of like in an outhouse. So your left hand does the, does the work and your right hand prays. So one day the right hand says to the left hand, look at you, they're dirty, look filthy. And I'm over here. I get all the finest, the finest, you know, treatment. I go to the churches. I go to the temples. I, you know, and look at you, you're in the, in the outhouse. So the left hand says, yeah, that's right. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that says it all. That's how he, he instructed us about ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not better than anybody. You know, we're all we're all here for a reason. You do your thing, I do my thing. Now, my thing may not really be better than your thing. It's just you're important, but so am I. You know, but uh, I don't know where where we've kind of drifted away. We've certainly drifted away in the last few years, mm -hmm. haven't we? Well, I think we have to all understand that there's constantly something to learn, something to be learned. To, to ever believe that you know everything and that all you need to do is talk because other people want to know what, what what you have to say that that is not how we grow we we grow by listening so you know always be open to listening and I think that's healthier well, I've seen I've seen all of this over my years as I say you know I just drift through all of this stuff and uh, I see a lot of people uh, who should remain nameless they don't listen to anyone they just you know continue on their path because they know everything well your your spiritual investigation <laughs> was unlike uh, the rest of the guys in the band and that probably yeah. saved you from what can be um, you know, the drug addled, alcohol addled touring years of a band, it probably kept you pretty well centered. Yeah, I, I'm very lucky. I, I've had a lot of influence like that. My mom, you know, I, I think I, I say it if there was eight days in the week, she would have gone to church eight, but there was Aww. only seven. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, I'm fortunate, you know, if you have a path and, and, you know, that's the interesting thing about today. The path is nice, except for, I don't think I should bestow my path on you mm -hmm. and that's what we have going on in this country about your introduction you know it's it's okay you can believe that but leave me alone you know i mean like i'm i'm, fine. I'm very happy in in what i have you know yeah but i do think there's a lot of people who are terrified of not being right and they don't understand that the 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 truth is multitudinous it's not one thing and so and we each have our own approach to to being alive so when you tell people who want to believe that it's either black or white or it's everything's binary, they get really scared when it, it's brought to their attention that they, they may not, there may be alternative viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you imagine if all the flowers were the same color? Good enough. All the trees had the same flora and fauna. I mean, like, I, I don't, I, I don't really think that's what God had in mind. I don't mm. think that's what America had in mind. When I was reading that thing way back when in school, 
you know, I, I, I thought we were supposed to have, uh, you know, uh, choices in this country. I didn't think we were all supposed to be like you or him or her, you know. Uh, that, that, that's really what I find interesting is the takeover or supposed takeover. I, I, I want to talk about um, some of the areas that the rascals were so groundbreaking. Atlantic Records is historically, you know, the great R&B label started by Ahmet Erdogan, Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, and the Rascals were the first white band ever signed by Atlantic Records. And you talk about what an amazing experience that was. You talk about the genius of producer Tom Dowd. Talk about the Atlantic years and what that did for your career. Well, Atlantic was the only label that would allow us, and, you know, I say us because I, I don't like to use the word me, to produce ourselves. I, I, I wanted to produce the band uh, individually. I, I, I did not want us to, you know, like, uh, you know, Phil Spector, who I idolized in terms of his talent and production. I, I didn't want to be with Phil because I knew we would be the Phil band rather than the, you know, the Felix band or the Rascal band. Atlantic was the only label that allowed us to do that. They allowed us to have complete freedom of movement. But they, they, they also had some phenomenal talent on board. You know, I, I don't know if, if any of you have read the Atlantic story. There's a big, you know, uh, co coffee table book that's out. Atlantic is an amazing story, mm -hmm. amazing story, you know. And, and, and the, 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 the how, how much they contributed to American music is, is unbelievable. So while working there, I was exposed to this uh, in a very, very interesting way, because in those days it was a very small place. You know, it wasn't Warner Brothers yet. You know, the talent that was around that that that, that little label was was just phenomenal, phenomenal. You know, I mean, the inventive people like Tom Dowd and you know Arif Mardin and 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 Amit and his brother Neshui and of course Jerry Wexler. It was a phenomenal experience for a young young guy. You know, and uh, I've always been uh, very grateful for them because uh, they, they they really really wanted to make good music. I know they wanted to make money. That that of course is a given. But they also they really specialized in good music. And they understood that the best way to make money was to allow artists to be their best rather than trying to control people. And That's from the jazz, the jazz idiom that, the, you know, they, they brought, you know, with the Neshui especially, because that's what you do with jazz. You know, you, you just turn the mic on and everybody plays and you capture the moment. You know, so that that's and that's what like, you wanted to do. You wanted to emu emulate the sound that you had live when you were playing. Exactly. Music. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's a technique that you have to learn when you go to a recording studio. It's all different, you know, because you, 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 you know, you don't have the visual to overtake, you know, like the, the mistakes, so to speak. So you've got to be pretty precise. But uh, the, the, the event happening, you know, uh, and, and recording that that that's really how music used to be made prior to computer technology. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it gave you that experience of, you know, it just brings all those I ideal um, facts factors in place, that experience has given you uh, a signpost so that you can, yeah. now that you have more control, I have to use the word control since we're kind of, kind of steer away from it, but you know, like now that you can be the architect of like the sound and the people that you want to surround yourself, you know what's possible because you had, in your formative years, you had those experiences. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think I, I learned that, you know, that's how producers work. I mean, good producers, well, I shouldn't say that because some producers are so powerful that they overpower the event. You know, you mentioned uh, Gamble Huff and, you know, of course, Phil. Uh, but, you know, the way Arif, you know, kind of taught me, you know, is that basically if someone comes in the room, you know, that's uh, talented, uh, you know, let me bring the talented out talent out in that person and put it to tape in those days and and that and that's what they did you know that's what he did that's what he, he showed me so, oh i see so you just let it happen the way the artist sees it not necessarily the way you see it see mm -hmm. and 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 th that was the joy of, of of working with him when you listen to one of those recordings are you do you sort of pick out a part and like remember how that was recorded and and who inspired that that particular element. yeah you know you, you remember everything you know and and uh most of all you remember that seriously uh, you, you, it, there's a joy in this you know 
I, I mean, if, if you have a creation, you know, uh, uh, and, and all of a sudden that creation becomes manifest through these big speakers, you know, mm. and then those big speakers get put to a disc and then it goes out to the public and they like it. It's pretty cool. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's yeah. pretty, pretty interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of these television programs that, you know, the way they, you know, they, they have people come on and they critique them, you know, and, 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 and I cringe, you know, because, you know, it, 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 you're critiquing my soul, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I just told you everything I loved and you said, what is that? No. <laughs> well, that's you know? why that's why on our show, we Fritz and I at the top of the show, we just recommend the things we like. I, I, there's so many different people that work on a thing that I, I just think to pick it apart is, is not I, right. It, it's not it's me. It's not, not me. Right. Yeah. I remember when that all started. I remember there was a, I think his name was Richard Goldberg or something like that. He actually, uh, in those days, you know, the magazines, this was a pre Rolling Stone magazine, you know, mm. when they had this. And, and he actually knocked the Beatles Whoa. in print. You remember that? Yeah, that's you know, Eric. He, came out with, he knocked a Beatle album. Oh my God! You know, like and and that boy, that wow! Now we got a whole career knocking people. <laughs> but that's arrogance, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I don't in. know. I mean, I thought it was really interesting. okay. Wow. Everybody loved them except for this one guy. One guy. <laughs> yeah. So you 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 had a couple of interesting incidents uh, at Atlantic. One was. That you met Otis Redding and he couldn't oh, yeah. believe you guys were white. <laughs> yeah, he, which is the greatest compliment Otis Redding could ever pay you. I'm guessing. Oh, but he was so funny, man. I mean, oh my God. See, Atl- Atlantic was was not like it was it was like a family, you know, and 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 basically there was no signs there, you know, that said like recording, do not enter. Mm. You know, it was like, hey, come in, man. You know, like, hey, you know, gee, I'd like to say hello to you. You know what I'm saying? And you know, they, it was just very open, you know. And uh, uh, so he came in that one day, uh, you know, and. You know, because he, he used to, he was he used to call the omelet omelet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was really a, a very very cool guy. That's very so cool. funny. Yeah, so he came to the door and knocked on. And he looked in. And he says, "My God, they are white." Oh, that's so cool! Wow. Pretty nice compliment coming from him. And talk yeah, about yeah. talk talk about um, the eye opening experience, the learning experience you had in a conversation with Sam Moore. Oh. oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that, that particular one you're, you're talking about was kind of like grow up, kid. Yeah, that was around the time when uh, the uh, uh, Blues Brothers came out with, uh, you know, the, they copped every, everything that Sam, <laughs> Sam and Dave mm-hmm. did, you know. And, 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 and uh, you know, and I, and I just very naively, hey, because I had every record these guys made. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they, there's not, too many better singers than Sam Moore oh on the God. planet Earth. Yeah. I mean, that's for sure. And he's still he's one bad dude, man. Let me tell you that that guy. And and and, and uh, I said, hey guys, I mean, how cool is that? And they say, hey little brother, man, look, 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 look man. They were like, chill, calm down a little bit, man. We're not making any money off this. I said, what? He was talking about Soul Man, right? This is Sam and Dave. He was talking oh, about, he was the, talking about the Soul whole man. Blues Brothers idiot. Oh, 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 okay. You know, they came out and copped everything, uh-huh. man. Wow. Chopsticks, and 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 uh, you, you know, you know, you don't get paid for that, do you? No, unless you wrote the songs. In which case, you know, in those days, if you wrote the songs, you're lucky if you had your name on it. Now, when you talked about, you know, your your um, publishing was sold, do you got you still have your songwriting? Yeah, but you know, that was then. You know, uh, uh, we. <laughs> See, uh, when the group broke up is when we kind of lost, uh, you know, uh, touch. Because we, we were told in the, in, in the beginning, the publishing is valuable. Do not get rid of it, you know. But when Eddie left, that's when the wolves come in, you know. Mm. That, that's when we, we lost our, the, the strength of a fiber of four people, you know. And it, it dissipated at that point. And, and it's a shame because, you know, it was a mistake, you know. And, and, that, and you know, the other subject that I've really tried to avoid in the, in the book is, is, is the kind of like, you know, the advice you get from legal people and from managerial people. You know, it's, it's a major thing to have someone take over your life in terms mm-hmm. of business, especially in the form of a manager. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a good manager that's got your best interest at heart, you're, you're really in tr- 
Again, I, I point to the movie Elvis. Go go see Elvis. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll Especially see when story. you're in your early 20s. You don't know anything then. So you're well, taking you the guys to, of You know, you try to because, you know, like it, it's, 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 it, it's, it's just a question of experience, you know, and, and being around and, you know, you, you get overpowered, you know, with the business, you mm-hmm. know. I had a book that I, I think I, I mentioned in, that I used to refer to called This Business of Music. Mm-hmm. which is well known throughout the industry uh, you know it, it told everything about contracts etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. but it did not tell the factor of dishonesty mm. you know and that's all over our business i mean my god if these people ever wrote books about you know what happened to them you know mm-hmm. it, it would kind of be a very sad, you know. And like, someone's pulling you aside and filling your head with compliments and then laying out, you know, their plan for you. And it sounds pretty good because this is sort of like if a busboy suddenly became the CEO of a restaurant chain. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. You know, because yes. you, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get. Oh, you mean the guy behind the bar was taking all that money? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Like you, you're, you're 24, you know, like right. how, what, what did any of us know at 24? And suddenly well, you're, you're, you've been like, skyrocketed to all, not only just all, all of this um these accolades and this position where the rest of the family is watching who gets the most close-ups on ed sullivan you know you're the focus of everyone's attention not just your fans but your family and you know the radio is playing your songs there's girls coming out of everywhere you may start taking some drugs that kind of like also impact your clarity That's so right. there's just a lot coming at a kid who, you yeah. know, most people spend 20 years getting to that level of prominence. Absolutely. Well, you know, interesting uh, enough, uh, I, I, you know, Paul McCartney told me one time, I went to see him in Memphis and, 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 and you know, we're all dads and granddads, you know. And he said, man, do you realize we were in our 20s when all that was going on? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, these guys were ruling the world. <laughs> Mm-hmm. in their 20s mm-hmm. you know and uh you know that's the truth i mean that was a big burden especially on those guys i mean you know like wow mm-hmm. you know they made a move to the right and the you know the, the earth's axis shifted a little bit you know <laughs> yeah yeah you mentioned that talk about the beatles you you were at the shea stadium concert you were there with yeah. sid bernstein and you, you talk yeah. about your connection to the beatles well, it was Sid. Sid was the connect. Well, n- not only was it Sid, but, you know, as I said, when I first started uh, with Joey D, uh, they transported me to Europe, to Germany and to Sweden. And uh, the group that was opening up for Joey D was unknown in the America at- yet. You know, it was called the Beatles. I saw <laughs> the Beatles before they went to Ed Sullivan, before they came to New York. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, that's that's really was a kicker. You know, that's. That's, uh, you know, basically when I knew that uh, I could do this. You know, I, I saw what they were. You know, I did not know at the time that they had this phenomenal musical writing ability. You know, except for when I heard their songs, you definitely paid attention. You said, like, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, you know, really interesting because it was very different from, you know, what, we were used to in in America, and uh, uh, but yeah, my connection with them was through Sid, and and it's so interesting because like, you know, over the years I, I was able to kind of get to know almost all of them. You know, John John was a little difficult to know because. You know, he couldn't see too well, so he would he would look at you like this, and you think, man, this guy doesn't like me at all. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know right? he couldn't see you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I toured with Ringo, and as I say, I got to know George a little bit, and it's it's hard to know a Beatle. You know, what I mean, it's it's really hard to know a Beatle. They're they're on a different uh, plane. There's no doubt. Yeah, that's an interesting statement because there's a, there's a lot swirling around them in any given conversation. Well, we had Laura Jacobson on who wrote that book about the, the Beatles at Shea about that one event. Oh, yeah. And tells the funny story about Sid's going to, Sid, Sid for, for people that don't remember or don't know, was this great promoter. He was the first guy to put a band in a stadium. He was the first guy to put rock and roll in Carnegie Hall. But also, he had a great idea. He had all the rascals in the dugout. He said, I'm going to take a, this opportunity at Shea Stadium to promote the rascals. So he had them up on the, on the, on the digital board there. Sure. And and, uh, and the Beatles manager saw that and said, take that down or the Beatles don't play. Well, there's no show, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a little embarrassing, but we got... We got yeah, the, we, I love that. No, those that's shows. like, you know, that's pre-internet, but like yeah. that's a banner. Mm-hmm. Like there's some, there's a lot of eyeballs on it. Uh, and 
I want to talk for a moment about the reverence that you have for your fans because you speak about them with so much love and respect. Talk about your fans. Well, it's a different thing, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I mean, like over the years, they've kind of grown up with with us, mm-hmm. you know, with me, and, and we still know them, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's... Um, I just, you know, as I say, I, I just always felt that the love that you get from people should be returned, you know, because uh, I don't just want your money to buy a product, you know, but when you when you when you connect with somebody uh, on on a musical level, you know, I mean, if you think about that, you know, the the the, the high energy of music, you know, mm-hmm. like when you go to Japan, for example, do they really understand the words, but they just love it mm. i mean uh, when i go to japan like I, 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 this, these people come up to me they go i want to be your son oh, oh really <laughs> what can wow. you say you know I, I i if you'll permit me to say this without being too personal i think swami g made a big um a, a big imprint on your soul because there's oh, yeah. no bitterness in your book even when you could lash out against people who did you wrong oh yeah oh yeah you you don't do that in the book and you're very yeah. positive and as Weezy said about your fans too it's actually very refreshing it's well, amazing you, you could get a that, book published without any salacious material <laughs> well, you know that's not the, that's not the, the the first time you know basically you know, like i say in the past that stopped other people from writing a book yeah. you know? Because, yeah. you know, you don't cause any trouble, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're George Martin, boy, I tell you, he, he, he certainly did, did it up with this House of Dragons and all this stuff. Oh, my God, you know, no. I, don't, I don't think people really want to hear all that stuff. You know, I, I really don't. I, I, I don't. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know everybody's got a little bit of that in their lives, but does anybody care about that? No, nah, I don't think so. Maybe. I don't. Well, the way that you put it was like, you know, we each have our side of the story and I'm, I'm going to tell mine. And... You know, I mean, seriously, it, uh, it's hard to complain. Yeah. It really is. Because, I mean, nothing's perfect. I mean, that's that's one of the things that he taught me. I mean, you know, he said, look, see, we're given names. Um, my name is uh, uh, Palita, mm-hmm. P-A-A-L-I-T-H-A, which means protected, protector. And I used to go to the guru all the time and complain, oh, these people are in the business. Oh, they're and so one day he said look let, let, let me explain let me explain to you now i'm going to translate this into american terms he says you know that madonna song the material world i said yeah well yeah kind of yeah he says well that's the world you're in you understand mm-hmm. if you don't want to put up with those changes and that nonsense and that stuff they don't care about you man come over here with me put on the robe no problems and I got the message. I finally understood. Okay, this is the world. This is it. Yeah. And uh, you got to grow up and, and, and just realize that's the world. And it's something I, I kind of call the cost of being alive. You're going you're gonna to miss a deal. You're going to turn left when you should have turned right. You're going to park your car and get a ticket. It's just the cost of being alive. And, you know, a lot of times when we're angry at people, we're angry at ourselves for trusting that person or for parking our car there. You know, we're angry at ourselves. And if you just give yourself that grace to say, I'm, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm going to lose money, stuff's going to go wrong, and then I'm going to pick up and learn from it and move on. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, again, you go into philosophy here, you know, basically, you know, like, uh, it, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, and you got to be careful how you say things because people misinterpret but it's kind of like a surrender okay mm-hmm. you know and 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 you know like you say when you when you learn to surrender and you trust you better trust something pretty high mm. you know, because when you start talking about people hmm <laughs> that's pretty like interesting that. so we're talking like about that. the beatles uh, <laughs> and the beatles came up with a you know the first concept album sergeant pepper and that Absolutely. led you guys to experiment with Freedom Suite and Once Upon a Dream. Talk about that process. Well, I, I really thought, you know, that the industry, uh, you know, really passed up on some really phenomenal music by, uh, they discouraged, they meaning the record companies, they, they didn't like the concept of those concept albums such as Tommy and uh, Sgt. Pepper and Pet Sweet, you know, Pet Sounds and all that. Uh, I thought that that was the American opera Mm-hmm. It's going to take over. I really thought that was going to be the record companies wanted you to make hit singles, 
you know and when you put a concept like album like that together unless you know like you're the Beatles and every song is just phenomenal it doesn't happen so they discourage that and I th I think they really made a mistake with that if they were looking for aesthetic you know rather than in financial you know rewards uh, we lost a, a lot of great you know, I, I like for example I, I wanted to do a, a, a musical Dune you know Dune the, mm -hmm. yeah. the Frank Herbert book yeah. uh, I, I just thought that was a great idea but yeah they inspired that that I, I thought it was a wonderful idea to put a, a conceptual album like that together mm -hmm. well there's a lot of really cool clips on YouTube if someone goes in there and types your name or the name of the rascals there's a clip on YouTube of you doing in the midnight hour with Tom Jones oh and yeah you write about it in your oh, yeah. book tell, tell us about that experience oh man that was see Tom's a really good guy man Tom Tom is a he's a bro and a half man and he sings his tail off and we we went and did a show with him in uh, in England where he had a, I guess he had his show over there and it was early I never forget because it was early in the morning and he was quite high <laughs> it was really high. He, okay. he had the uh, mimosa in the morning, you know what I'm saying? And <laughs> yeah. so we, we went on there, man. And, you know, it was a mutual kind of admiration society there because, you know, God, you know, he was phenomenal. And, and he, he liked us, I could tell. So when we did, we did Midnight Hour, man, it, it, was, it was magic. It was magic. No doubt about it. Yeah, that's it right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, you, you can tell you can feel the respect because it's like, oh, you, you know, you're thinking that guy can sing and he's thinking that kid can play. That kid, yeah, yeah, we, we were so rocking, soulful. man. I, I, I got his eyes a couple of times, man. And, you know, wow, man, it was just, you know, that's what it's all about, man. Yeah. You know, you, you, you sing for each other, you know. Oh, yeah, you really do. It's a connection. I love that. There's a connection. No doubt about it. I, I did this one time, which I did. Uh, uh, I did a television show and uh, my my. Idol was on the panel there. Uh, it was Ray Charles was sitting there. Wow. In the, in the show. And, 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 and he couldn't see me, man. But, you know, I was at the band. I was I was playing with uh, uh, the band. And, and, man, everything I sang was direct right towards him. And, you know, when I, when I, when I hit something good, he would go... Oh, <laughs> made my day, man. That's oh. so cool. Yeah, there, you, cool. You played with Ringo's All Star Band, which yeah. was like action. But talk about all the people that were playing when you were doing with Ringo. Well, you know, for those who don't know, what Ringo does uh, is uh, uh, he he brings people. Uh, like for example, we had uh, Randy Bachman from mm -hmm. Bachman Turner. We had uh, Mark Farner from Grand Funk. We had Billy Preston. We had John Entwistle. Uh, uh, they bring he brings us together, and, and we do like each other's songs. We and we do like a circle, you know. And you know, Ringo does his song. We back him up, and then Mark does his song. Randy does his song. That that's that's what that's like, you know. And. Uh, it is just so interesting working with him because everybody, everybody respects the heck out of him. You know, like it's like a bunch of kids, you know, we're in the dressing room, you know, and everybody's talking, talking. And all of a sudden, somebody will ask, they'll ask Ringo a question. Like, for example, hey, Ringo, uh, how come you, uh, uh, how come you, uh, uh, you, you had your drum, your, your stool up so high, you know? And, and as soon as he starts to answer, everybody stops talking. Yeah. And wants to hear what he says. He says, well, I gotta be seen, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> simple as that. So, what? Talk about what we should know if Smokey Robinson should ask us if we play cards. <laughs> yeah, what? don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see the old the old timers, man. You know they they had a. a they had an interesting life, you know. Before they before they became extremely wealthy, they they used to, you know, like they used to gamble. They used to, you know, gamble in the in the buses and stuff like that, you know. And again, you're a young kid coming into the music industry. You better be aware of what's going on there, man. Or you're not going to get out alive, you know. They know what they're doing. <laughs> yes, I, I was always interested in the the uh, disagreements between a band and the record company, and who wins those disagreements. You talked about. Uh, the record companies not wanting to do concept albums because they didn't think it was going to oh, be yeah. financially successful. But also there were individual arguments like talk about um, them not wanting to do, release Groovin' as a single because it had bongos on it. For some <laughs> reason that turned everybody out. And also uh, they didn't want you to release People Got to Be Free, right. which yeah. was went on to become this great anthem for the civil rights movement. And they didn't like it because it was too political. Talk about that. The, well, those disagreements so, yeah. and, and who, who wins in those in the long run well your lawyer <laughs> <laughs> 
See, the, 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 the difference is your contract. See, if your contract says you have the say, then you have the say. If your contract does not say that, then they win. And this is this is an ongoing thing with with artists. It's just that, you know, I I kind of well, you know, I Dion uh, befriended me when I was you know up and coming, and 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 he kind of gave me a little bit of an education as to what to expect from the people behind the desk, you know. So I I, I knew before we signed you know a contract that you know we got to have control or we don't have control, mm-hmm. and it's as simple as that. And and so we had control. So when I had an argument with Mr. Rexler, Jerry, rest his soul, we'd go at it, man. You know, we'd really go at it. But I, I had the final say, man, on the paper. Oh, good. Okay. And we also had some help. I, I, the stories in the book about grooving with Murray the K, you know, coming yeah. to mm-hmm. bat for us. And See, you know, I understand, you know, basically, a friend of mine wrote a song called It's Not the Money, It's the Money. <laughs> And I really, I get it. I, they're not here to save the world. They're here to make make money. You know what I'm saying? And 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 it, it's even more so now than it ever was. You know, in the old days, Columbia used to have some artists that they knew weren't going to sell product, but they were honored to have them on their red label. You know, and I don't know if that happens anymore. Mm. You know. Let's talk about your your current band because now you're playing with guys that that you love and respect, and you've been with a lot longer than you were with the Rascals oh, in this absolutely, relationship. Yeah. And uh, talk about these guys and what you've what you've done together. Well, you know, uh, as you say, mo- moving to Nashville uh, because of the music community here, I, I initially came down here to, to to be very involved in songwriting. Uh, until, you know, Spotify and those people came along and kind of ruined that for us, you know, because that's a whole different thing now. But we, we started to get uh, a, a tremendous plethora of musicians coming in from California and New York, and now the level of, of, of the, uh, the session people is up here, you know. Well, uh, there's a thing down here in Tennessee in Nashville that I, that I, 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 I said I was getting an award down here. There's a respect for music here. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really exist in a lot of the country. You know, they, they they don't know. For example, there's people like publishers and songwriters. They they don't they know that here. See, and and if you're a person whose name you know most people don't know because you wrote the songs and didn't sing the songs, they know you. See, Mm -hmm. well, the musicians that come here carry that or bring that or learn that here. So I've been very, 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 very blessed to have some guys who not only love to play, but they love to play my music with me. You know, Uh, you can't ask for much more. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, seriously, they're great guys. They're great musicians and they enjoy. There's a respect factor. You know, it's kind of the difference between you know just hiring somebody and loving somebody you know i mean it's true so we got a great bunch of guys and uh are you back out on the road yet or we will be shortly as a matter of fact as we speak um you know i i I don't know if you realize in 2019 i I tried a reunion with uh, some of the guys in the original band and uh, mr gene cornish he had a heart attack on stage oh you know? right you wrote about that i, I don't know if i if i put that in the book yes it was, it's very it was scary 2019 but he uh he almost didn't make it well the good news is that he wants to go out again. Oh, oh cool. cool. He wants to go out again. So, uh, okay, we'll see what happens. We're going out in November. Uh, it's a long story, and, you know, like to, it, it, we'll see what happens, but he wants to go out again. G- Gene has always been a, uh, you know, he, he came from Rochester, New York, you know, and, 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 and he always looked at that stage, man. He saw, like, Chuck Berry, and he saw, like, you know, and, and, and I want to play like those guys. I want to be. So he's always been a ham. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So he's, he's really anxious. So that's, the, that's, that's what's coming up. And, of course, we'll use pretty much my band as, 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 as the backing. Got it. And we're trying to put something together that really makes a difference. You know what I'm saying? That, mm-hmm. you know, put a little theme by, behind it. Like, let, let's do some universal love. And you Remember those words? Peace, love, and happiness? You know what I mean? Good that? for you. Somebody's got to spread it around. Yeah, we and gotta, I we, think... We, we, it's, it's time, don't you think? Yeah, and I think the, the word understanding is a big piece of that equation because, you know, as we talked about earlier in the show, we're not all alike. But we, but if we can understand 
one another and understand okay that like that guy th- this person she's different than me and i and i respect that because not everybody looks at the world the way i do <laughs> you know it's funny when i'm when i'm on stage you know i i, I do this song you know we, we wrote this song called a ray of hope you know so i announced it like this i said i remember when you used to you could be able to write a song without pissing anybody off <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I say, you know, like, uh, you put out a song and they hate you. No, no, that's it. I don't want to talk to this guy anymore. Absolutely. He's one of those. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? That. You know what? I, it's really strange out there, man. I'll tell you. I'll tell you something. This is pretty interesting world we're, we're jumping well, into. Well, you're here. very positive in just in your interaction with us and in your book. And that, I think that's refreshing. It really but, you is. know, I, I don't know. I, so. I think humans are we're we're evolving but we're kind of eternally the same in in terms of the way we're wired i was watching a documentary last night on pbs and it's just footage that we've seen often of the edmund pettus bridge and john lewis and someone was holding a sign that said integration is socialism and yeah. it just pretty much mirrors what yeah, people that people are calling anything that is inclusive socialism yeah. and it isn't yeah. necessarily socialism it's just an open mind but uh, don't take my medicare yeah <laughs> it, it, or social security exactly don't get, take my social oh, is your, that? yes it is darling yeah. yes. like yes. Yes. what happened to security being half of that phrase like you can't just threaten to take it away every five years or there's no security I, I, I like the commercial, that, and, and I'm really not a big fan of commercial, but I, when Etta James sings security on that. Oh, that's that, fantastic. That, oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. You, wow. You're, you're, is right. Felix, yeah, you're I also, uh, you're well, also yeah. a producer. I, wanna, I don't want to wrap this up before I mention that you produced, for my money, one of the greatest songwriters right. in the American canon, Laura yeah. Nero who wrote Wedding Bell Blues and When I Die by Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which is like the quintessential song for anybody over 60 it's fantastic and yeah. stony and talk about your relationship with her and how it was to produce her well um i was introduced to her by david geffen david was her manager mm-hmm. and uh he said how would you like to meet the most impossible person <laughs> <laughs> really? why not <laughs> and uh you know because she was tough you yeah, know, yeah. and the reason that she was tough is because she had, you know, what we were talking about earlier, she had the vision of what she wanted in her song. Mm. Whatever that was, to be translated in, in her language, which was a very different language from, you know, the, the, the ones that you learn in classical music, you know, it had colors in it. Mm. You know, she, she spoke in colors. Wow. You know? Yeah, when, when you're, you're in front of the musicians out there, she would say to the horn section, you got to make it more red. Really? That's yeah. interesting. Oh, I love that. You know, I, I, oh, believe me. And so we had to kind of interpret, okay, red. Let me see. <laughs> let me look. No, no, red is not in the Italian uh, dictionary. <laughs> there, no. <laughs> but that was her. She was so different from, you know, I, I could go on. But, you know, I, I introduced her to my teacher, my guru, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she ended up, you know, buying his home actually and, and staying there but, and living there but when i when i first brought her into the room uh he wasn't there yet and when when he came in the room she burst into tears wow just burst into tears like and, and i left because i realized it was kind of like a real intimate moment that mm-hmm. was taking place mm-hmm. and i asked her she said i never saw anything like that oh my goodness yeah she was so sensual right that it was dangerous. Yeah, she, she, <laughs> she was so, uh, you know. I mean, that's that's why the you know the the, the the gay community adore her. I think she felt everything. She felt everything, you know. And when you were next to her, you felt everything. Believe mm, me, because wow. she just vibrated this kind of sensualness that was so like, like Nina Simone had the same kind of the, get out of the way, man. You know. Right. And and she had this vision of her music, and so it was our job to try to, try to interpret that to you know, as I said earlier, to her wishes, and it was wonderful because you know I did I did it with Arif Mardin, and we hired the Muscle Shoals gentlemen, and yeah. I do mean gentlemen. You know, these guys came oh, from yeah. they came from Alabama up to New York. They they had played with Aretha too, but I mean 
they, they, they were so kind to her because when she would do her things, which was kind of like, you know, when you're doing sessions, you don't slow down, you don't change tempo, you know. You, you, yes, yes, Miss Nero. Yes, yes, Miss Nero. However you want us to play it, that's how we play it, mm -hmm. you know. But she was charming, you know, mm. charming, really charming. She was a delight. And you write about Talented her so, woman. so eloquently yeah. and reverently, and it's... Yeah, she, she was a great lady. She just was so... But anyway, my, my teacher said, you know, Swami said, she really was born 100 years ago. Yeah. Wow. She had that 100-year-old mentality rather than current. Right. Hmm. Yeah, she, she was a very, very sensual soul. And you were able to give her to all of us, so... We're grateful. Well, I, I tell you, she, she's finally getting some serious recognition out there. There's a lot of movement on her music right now that I think you're going to be hearing about very shortly. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. I can't wait to hear more. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up here because we know uh, that you are a busy man. Now, what was it that you might want to promote or mention that we haven't yet mentioned? The rascals are coming. The rascals are coming. We're on the <laughs> billboard again. Yeah, we're going back on the road. You know, post-COVID is pretty interesting. COVID really hit our, our business pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm just hoping that, you know, my demographic, you know, they feel safe coming out because we'd like to entertain them, even if it's just one last time around, you know. But that's what I'm promoting right now. I've got a CD that I've uh, finished over the over the COVID uh, year, and I'm trying to get that out. As you say, I've got that book, you know, and uh, just want to continue going, man. That's all. Well, it, it's just definitely a, a beautiful enthusiasm and joy for life that you have that is in, inspirational for all of us, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for all the beautiful sounds you put into the universe, and you are a huge part of my youth, my friend. It's an oh, honor you guys to talk are great. to you. I thank you so much for having me because, you know, I feel, you know, I feel it coming over the airwaves. God bless you. Good, well, we can't wait you. to meet you, right in, back in, at you in person. Here let's do it. Let's do it. Here come our closing credits. Fritz and I have created a web hub to help you shop for gifts and save democracy in one fun move. Giftofdemocracy.com curates great swaggy merch from candidates and causes committed to protecting and defending our democracy. Fritz and I make no money here. We don't need it. We are not running for office this year. <laughs> our site is like a mall directory sign that points you towards the merchandise pages of candidates and causes that are working to save our democracy. It's the donation that counts. Democracy makes a great gift. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, or we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at Media Path Podcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show, please give us a rave and glowing review in Apple Podcasts <laughs> and brag about your excellent taste in podcasts on social media. You can sign up for our fun and dishy newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Felix Cavalieri. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. Like this all the time. Well, there, yeah, you know, we did, uh, we've done people that you probably worked with.